Hello and welcome to today's lesson on wave particle duality, which is part of the particles and radiation topic in AQA A level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at explaining what wave particle duality is. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson, we should be able to explain why photons have a dual nature, describe how we know that matter has a dual nature, and then discuss why we can change the wavelength of a matter particle, but not that of a photon, which links into the the following part of the AQA A-Level Physics Specification 3.2.2.4 Wave Particle Duality. So light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum of waves and the theory of electromagnetic waves proposed by James Clerk Maxwell predicted the existence of the electromagnetic spectrum and since then we had the discovery of x-rays, radio waves, it was the idea that light must be a wave. Now we've had a discussion previously about the true nature of electromagnetic radiation, in particular visible light. Was it a particle or was it a wave? Now Newton argued that light particle, light's behaviour must indicate it's a, part, a particle, and this was confirmed later when the photoelectric effect stated that light must act as a particle. But Thomas Young had stated that light must be a wave as it diffracts through gaps and forms an interference pattern, and diffraction and interference can only occur to waves. So light must must be acting like a wave. Now which side was right? Well actually both sides were right. Sometimes electromagnetic radiation photons acts as a particle and sometimes electromagnetic radiation acts as a wave. So this proved that electromagnetic radiation could act as an electromagnetic wave or it could act like a photon particle. It had wave particle duality and researchers have actually observed light photons acting as both particles and waves simultaneously. Now it was therefore indicated that electromagnetic radiation has a dual nature. It can behave like a wave or a particle depending on the circumstances. Now diffraction and interference could only be understood via the wave model, whilst the photoelectric effect could only be explained using the particle model. Now in 1924, Louis de Broglie hypothesised that particles of matter, like electrons, should have wave properties, because in his PhD thesis he stated that if wave-like light showed particle properties, i.e. they act like photons, particles like electrons should be expected to show wave-like properties. Now at the time, most physicists were not very accepting of this theory, but his work was evaluated by other physicists through peer review, and his hypothesis was confirmed by experiments. Now this theory of wave-particle duality has been accepted to be true at least until any new conflicting evidence comes along. Now de Broglie's work is an example of how knowledge and understanding on the nature of matter has changed over time. So, an electron and all matter can display wave behaviour, so it can be shown with a wavelength called the de Broglie wavelength. Now de Broglie deduced the wavelength of any matter and we indicated this in the following equation, that the de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant h over the momentum of the particle p. Now we know from previous work that momentum can be calculated by times in mass by velocity, so we can also write this equation as the de Broglie wavelength is equal to h over mv. Now this indicates to us we can alter the wavelength of the particle by changing its velocity. Now this equation can only be used for matter particles. It cannot be used to work out the wavelength of a wave because if you try to calculate this answer for a wave the mass would, give be, would be zero and this would give you a wavelength of infinity which is obviously nonsense. Now the wavelength and the wave nature of a particle can be dependent on its properties, i.e. its de Broglie wavelength. So the more massive a particle, the smaller its wavelength. Now this is why we don't observe wave behaviour on a massive object, for example humans. Now the faster we move a particle, the smaller its de Broglie wavelength becomes, and if a particle is stationary, it exhibits no wave properties whatsoever. It has a wavelength of zero. So if a particle is stationary, then it's purely matter. Now the mass mentioned in this equation is the overall mass of the particle. So it's the rest mass of the particle plus its relativistic or 
moving mass. Now, all matter has a de Broglie wavelength, and we can use this to determine their wave nature. Now, in the waves topic, we've looked at wave behavior and the wave mechanism. Now, in the wave mechanism diffraction, you are aware that the greatest effect of diffraction happens when the gap size is approximately the same size as the wavelength. This means if we pass matter through a gap with a similar size to the de Broglie wavelength, then the matter should also diffract. So, for example, here is an electron pattern which is forming on the screen due to diffraction. Now, for particles, diffraction will take place when the gap size that the particle moves through is similar to its de Broglie wavelength, which you can calculate. So, this for electrons can allow us to show electron diffraction very easily. So, you can observe here an electron diffraction pattern forming on the screen. Now, we can demonstrate the idea of wave particle duality when electrons are fired at graphite. Now the electrons pass through the graphite and hit a luminescent screen and pass in, and produce patterns of rings associated with diffraction. Now the diffraction occurred as the de Broglie wavelength of the electron was approximately the same as the gaps in the graphite. But electrons are particles so should not exhibit this same phenomena unless they also behave like waves. So this was fundamental proof that like light, electrons and all other particles have a wave particle duality. The production of rings indicates an interference pattern. Constructive interference takes place when the bright rings form and destructive interference takes place where the dark rings form. So this is conclusive proof that in this example electrons must be exhibiting wave behaviour. Because if the electrons were exhibiting particle behaviour then only a dot would be seen on the screen. Now when carrying out this procedure, the velocity of electrons must be carefully monitored so that it can we can alter the size of the de Broglie wavelength. So as a result, the de Broglie wavelength will be similar to the gap size in the graphite, so we can observe this diffraction pattern. Now, the diffra this diffraction pattern is not observed when humans walk through gaps, as our de Broglie wavelength is much smaller than the gaps which we travel through, which is why we don't observe our wave behaviour. So whilst all matter has a wave of nature and a de Broglie wavelength, it's not observed in larger objects as this de Broglie wavelength is much smaller than the macroscopic environment they exist in. So the de Broglie wavelength of a human is much smaller than the gap size such as a door that a human walks through. But all matter can there be observed uh, with its wave properties more easily on a microscopic environment as in these smaller objects the wavelength of that due to its de Broglie wavelength is comparable to the gap size it passes through. So an electron has a de Broglie wavelength of similar size to gaps between graphite atoms. So this diffraction is observed with electrons moving through the graphite as the de Broglie wavelength is approximately the distance between the graphite atoms, which is why we observe electron wave behavior. So in the electron diffraction experiment, the electrons in the beam pass through a metal foil and are diffracted in certain directions. They form a pattern of rings on a fluorescent screen at the end of the tube. Each ring is due to electrons diffracting by the same amount from the grains of different orientations. Now the diffraction pattern is produced is is a, as a ring as the gaps in the graphite are circular. Now rectangular patterns are produced like you saw in the waves topic if the gaps that the that the um, object moves between is in fact rectangular. Now it's interesting to note that when Ernest Rutherford carried out his famous scattering experiment 20 years earlier, he didn't know about this physics concept and it could have had disastrous consequences. Now he was lucky because the de Broglie wavelength of an alpha particle is much smaller than the gap size between gold atoms which he fired them at. Now if the alpha particle had a de Broglie wavelength similar to the gaps between the gold atoms, then the alpha particles would have produced a diffraction pattern. So this means Rutherford would have actually gained his observations which allowed him to deduce the existence of the nucleus. Now this concept had not been uncovered when Rutherford had carried out this investigation so it meant Rutherford hadn't considered this at all. It was purely happenstance that he picked a suitable at atom for the alpha particles to pass through without causing them to diffract as they move through. So by the way it's very interesting to note that um, Rutherford's method of firing alpha particles at gold atoms gives a rough estimation of 
of the size of the nucleus via electrostatic propulsion, but the size of the nucleus due to particle diffraction gives an even more accurate value than the value gained in Rutherford's scattering experiment. Now, the fact that electrons also act as waves as well as particles allows physicists to answer one of the most fundamental questions in physics. Why is the nucleus so small, yet the atom so large? Why does the atom need to be 99.99999% empty space? So why have a nucleus 10,000 times smaller than an atom that it's, it's part of? Now we can use wave-particle duality to solve these questions about the universe. Now we know from the nuclear atomic model, we know that the atom is mainly empty space. Now the atom is mainly empty space because it needs this space to fit the wavelengths of the electron waves in. So as a result, the electrons are acting like a wave when they're found in the atom. So this means that they will have a wavelength and the size of the wavelength is comparable to the size of the atom. So the radius of the atom equates to the largest wavelength of the electron in the atom. Now this can be visualized as the longest wavelengths are the electrons in the highest orbitals. So previously we've looked at energy levels relating to the amount of energy required for the electron to exist at that particular level. Now the energy levels of the atom also relate to the different harmonic frequencies of the electron wave. So this is why excitation occurs instantaneously because the electron will immediately switch frequency from one harmonic wave to another harmonic wave and appear to us to be excited. Now this is why only the exact amount of energy is required to move energy levels as this is the exact amount of energy needed to have a stable wave oscillation. So the energy levels related to the amount of energy required to excite the electrons into a new frequency of vibration. And that's also why higher energy levels need more energy to be stable. They're higher harmonic frequencies, so need more energy to exist. So this gives physics the current image of the atom. It's a nucleus with a series of electron probability waves existing around it. So no longer do we have electrons orbiting the atom. No longer do we have electrons existing in energy levels around the atom. It's around the nucleus, my apologies. What we do have is we have a nucleus and we have electron wave patterns forming around the nucleus. So the electrons form different standard harmonic waves around the nucleus, given to, giving us our different energy levels. So what should we know from today's lesson? You should know that the electron diffraction suggests that particles possess wave properties and the photoelectric effect suggests that electromagnetic waves have a particular nature. You should be aware that the de Broglie wavelength is equal to h over mv, where mv is the momentum, you should be able to explain how and why the amount of diffraction changes when the momentum of a particle is changed, have an appreciation of how knowledge and understanding on the nature of matter has changed over time, an appreciation that such changes need to be evaluated through peer review and are validated by the scientific community. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to explain why photons have a dual nature. Describe how we know that matter has a dual nature and finally discuss why we can change the wavelength of a matter particle but not that of a photon. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on wave particle duality which is part of the particle and radiation topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely day.